Yeah, for those of you who enjoyed the Free Willy movie, um, the state of Oregon, with something like $12 million in lottery funds, decided to import Kiko the whale, the Free Willy whale, who had a skin disease and was languishing in a really miserable swimming pool in Mexico City. So we imported Kiko the whale and built this huge, beautiful new aquarium in Newport, Oregon, and brought K Kiko up. And a friend of mine, Brad, name withheld, was a marine biologist. And he started telling the rest of us how, yes, Kiko the whale, who had never been socialized, had a nasty habit of self-abuse. <laughs> and there was a huge picture window below the surface of the water. And that was Kiko's favorite partner. <laughs> so people watching Kiko were like watching tennis as this giant whale dong went back and forth against that window. And at one point, all those little children went <laughs> and all the ejaculate would flow to the surface. And Brad said, we are all getting really tired of getting the nets out. And so for a long time, they sequestered the whale in a separate part of the tank, and they showed it porno trying to exhaust it all night long. And this is sort of a, a typical thing to do with, with zoo animals, trying to get this thing so worn out that during the public hours, it will not do anything but just float there, exhausted. <laughs> Covered with its own filth. Well, Kiko the whale isn't our fault, isn't our problem anymore. But, uh, but it's funny because almost everything I write has that little bit of truth in it, at least a little bit of truth in it. And more often than not, there's an enormous amount of truth in it. There is so much truth in it that you would not believe the truth in it. In fact, the piece I'm going to read tonight is three true stories that, and I hesitate to tell you if they're true, because you will not want to believe that they're true stories. And. Uh, and there are three stories that for the longest time, every time I got on an airplane, I said, please God, do not crash this plane because I am the only one of your children that knows these three true masturbation stories. <laughs> and until I do something with these stories, until I get these down on paper in some form, you gotta keep me alive. So, uh, so I'd like to read this story and we'll follow that with a Q&A, and then there is no sort of hurry or panic, because I will be happy to sign everybody afterwards. So. Yeah. Oh, and the social retard thing? When I was in seventh grade, a girl moved to my school, this little tiny school in Burbank, Washington. It's a town of about 600 people. And her family was from someplace else, which made them exotic. And her name was Glenda. And I had this huge crush on Glenda Hawes. So all year, I just sort of mooned over Glenda Hawes. And one day at her locker, she was taking some books out. And one of the books slipped, and it caught in her necklace and it broke the string, and all the crystal beads, they were this really flashy kind of crystal, they all fell to the ground. And so I instantly got down and I started picking them up with her. And I'm picking them up, and in fact, I was so obsessed with Glenda Hawes, I stole three, I put them in my pocket. <laughs> and as I'm giving them to her, and we're both down there, very intimate, very, both of us crouched down just together, face to face, nose to nose, uh, she goes, she had a southern accent. She goes, uh, she goes, y'all are real sweet. You are really sweet. And she goes, you know, when I moved here, everybody else told me that y'all, you was retarded. <laughs> and there is nothing like finding out in the seventh grade that your entire peer group 
tells every new kid that you're retarded. <laughs> so, the short story is called Guts. It is structured and based on Edgar Allan Poe's premature burial, and it is a chapter from next year's book, a big, fat, 450-something page novel called Haunted, which is all basically ghost stories. This is unlike any ghost story you've ever heard. So, guts. <clears throat> Inhale. Take in as much air as you possibly can. This story should last about as long as you can hold your breath and then just a little bit longer, so listen as fast as you can. A friend of mine, when he was 13 years old, he heard all about pegging. Pegging is when a guy gets banged up the butt with a dildo. You stimulate the prostate gland hard enough, and the rumor is that you can have explosive hands-free orgasms. At that age, at 13, this friend's a little sex maniac. He's always jonesing for a better way to get his rocks off. So he goes out to buy a carrot and some petroleum jelly to conduct a little private research. Then he pictures how it's going to look at the supermarket check stand. <laughs> the lonely carrot and the petroleum jelly rolling down the conveyor belt <laughs> toward the grocery store cashier all the other shoppers waiting in line watching, everybody seeing the big evening he has planned. <laughs> so my friend, he goes and he buys milk and eggs and sugar and a carrot, all the ingredients for a carrot cake and Vaseline. <laughs> like he's gonna go home and stick a carrot cake up his butt. <laughs> that fits with that cake and sodomy part. At home, he whittles a carrot into a blunt little tool. He slathers it with a grease and he grinds his ass down on it. Then nothing, no orgasm, nothing happens except it hurts like hell. <laughs> then this kid, his mom yells at supper time. She says to come down right now. So he works the carrot out and he stashes this slippery, filthy thing in the dirty clothes underneath his bed. After dinner, he goes to find the carrot, but it's gone. <laughs> All his dirty clothes. While he was eating dinner, his mom grabbed them to do the laundry. No way could she not find the carrot, carefully shaped with a paring knife from her kitchen, still shiny with lube and stinky. <laughs> this friend of mine, he waits months under a black cloud waiting for his folks to confront him, and they never do, ever. Even now that he's grown up, that invisible carrot, it hangs over every Christmas dinner, <laughs> every birthday party, every Easter egg hunt with his kids, his parents' grandkids, that ghost carrot is hovering over all of them. That's something too awful to talk about. People in France, they have a phrase, spirit of the stairway. In French, esprit de escarier. It means that moment when you find the answer, but it's just too late. Say you're at a party and somebody insults you. You have to say something. So under pressure with everybody watching, you say something really lame. But the moment you leave the party, as you start down the stairway, then magic. You come up with that perfect thing you should have said, that perfect crippling put down. That is spirit of the stairway. The trouble is even the French don't have a phrase for the stupid things you actually do say under pressure. <laughs> Those stupid, desperate things you actually think or do. Some deeds are just too low to even get a name, too low to even get talked about. Looking back, kids psych experts, school counselors, they now say that most of the last peak in teen suicide was just kids trying to choke while they beat off. 
their folks would find them, a towel twisted around the kid's neck, the towel tied to the rod in their bedroom closet, their kid dead, dead sperm everywhere. Of course their folks cleaned up. They put some pants on their kid. They made it look better, intentional at least, the regular sad kind of teen suicide. Another friend of mine, a kid from school, his older brother in the Navy said how, how guys in the Middle East, they jack off different than we do over here. This brother was stationed in some camel country where the public market sells what could be fancy letter openers. Each fancy tool is just a thin rod of polished brass or silver, maybe as long as your hand, but with a big tip at one end, either a big metal ball or the kind of fancy carved handle that you'd see on a sword. This Navy brother, he says how Arab guys, they get their dick hard, and then they insert this metal rod inside the whole length of their boner. They jack off with a rod in, inside, and it makes getting off so much better, more intense. It's this big brother who travels around the world sending back French phrases, Russian phrases, helpful jack-off tips. <laughs> After this, the little brother, one day he doesn't show up at school. That night he calls to ask if I'll pick up his homework for the next couple weeks because he's in the hospital. <laughs> he's got to share a room with old people getting their guts worked on. He says how they all have to share the same television. All he's got for privacy is a curtain. His folks don't come to visit. On the phone, he says how right now his folks could just kill his big brother in the Navy. On the phone, the kid says how the day before, he was just a little bit stoned. At home in his bedroom, he was flopped on the bed. He was lighting a candle and flipping through some old porno magazines, getting ready to beat off. This is after he's heard from his Navy brother that helpful hint about how Arabs beat off. The kid looks around for something that might do the job. A ballpoint pen is too big. A pencil is too big and too rough. But dripped down the side of the candle, there's a thin, smooth ridge of wax that just might work. With just the tip of one finger, this kid snaps the long ridge of wax off the candle. He rolls it smooth between the palms of his hands, long and smooth and thin, stoned and horny. <laughs> he slips this down inside, deeper and deeper into the piss slit of his boner. And with a good hank of the wax still poking out the top, he gets to work. Even now, he says those Arab guys are pretty damn smart. <laughs> they have totally reinvented jacking off. <laughs> Flat on his back in bed, things are getting so good, this kid can't keep track of the wax. He's one good squeeze from shooting his wad when the wax isn't sticking out anymore. The thin wax rod, it slipped inside, all the way inside. So deep inside, he can't even feel the lump of it inside of his piss tube. From downstairs, his mom shouts, it's supper time. <laughs> she says to come down right now. This wax kid and the carrot kid they're different people, but we all live pretty much the same life. <laughs> it's after dinner when the kid's guts start to hurt. It's wax, so we figured it would just melt inside of him and he'd just piss it out. But now his back hurts, his kidneys, he can't even stand up straight. This kid talking on the phone from his hospital bed, in the background you can hear Bells ding, people screaming, game shows. The x-ray showed the truth. Something long and thin bent double inside of his bladder. 
this long, thin V inside of him. It's collecting all the minerals in his piss. It's getting bigger and more rough, coated with crystals of calcium. It's bumping around, ripping up the soft lining of his bladder, blocking his piss from getting out. His kidneys are backed up. What little that does leak out of his dick is red with blood. This kid, him and his folks, his whole family, them looking at the black x-ray with the doctors and the nurses standing there, the big V of wax glowing bright white for everybody to see. He has to tell the truth. <laughs> the way Arabs get off. <laughs> what his big brother wrote him from the Navy. On the phone right now, he starts to cry. They paid for the bladder operation with his college fund. <laughs> One stupid mistake, and now he'll never be a lawyer. <laughs> sticking stuff inside yourself, sticking yourself inside of stuff, a candle in your dick or your head in a noose, we all knew this was gonna be big trouble. What got me in trouble, I used to call it pearl diving. This meant whacking off underwater, sitting on the bottom at the deep end of my parents' swimming pool. With one deep breath, I'd kick my way to the bottom and slip off my swim trunks. I could sit down there for two, three, four minutes. Just from jacking off, I had huge lung capacity. <laughs> if I had the house to myself, I could do this all afternoon. Finally, after I'd pump out my stuff, my sperm, it would hang there in big, fat, milky gobs. After that was just more diving to catch it, to collect it and, wipe, and to wipe each handful in a towel. That's why it was called pearl diving. <laughs> Even with chlorine, there was my sister to worry about, or Christ Almighty, my mom. That used to be my worst fear in the whole world. My teenage virgin sister thinking she's just getting fat and then giving birth to a two-headed retard baby. <laughs> Both heads looking just like me. <laughs> me, the uncle and the father. In the end, it's never what you worry about that gets you. The best part of pearl diving was the water inlet port for the swimming pool filter and the circulation pump. The best part was getting naked and sitting on it. As the French would say, who doesn't like getting their butt sucked? <laughs> Still, Still one minute you're just a kid getting off and the next minute you'll never be a lawyer. <laughs> one minute I'm settling on the pool bottom and the sky is wavy light blue through eight feet of water above my head. The world is silent except for the heartbeat in my ears. My yellow striped swim trunks are looped around my neck for safekeeping, just in case a friend, a neighbor, anybody shows up to ask why I skipped football practice. The steady suck of the pool inlet hole is lapping at me, and I'm grinding my skinny white ass around on that feeling. One minute, I've got enough air and my dick's in my hand. My folks are gone at their work, and my sister's got ballet and nobody's supposed to be home for hours. My hand brings me right to getting off, and I stop. I swim up to catch another big breath. I dive down and settle on the bottom. I do this again and again. This must be why girls want to sit on your face. The suction is like taking a dump that never ends. <laughs> My dick hard, and getting my butt eaten out, I do not need air. <laughs> my heart beats in my ears. I stay under until bright stars of light start worming around in my eyes. 
My legs straight out, the back of each knee rubbed raw against a concrete bottom. My toes are turning blue, my toes and fingers wrinkled from being so long in the water. And then I let it happen. The big white gob starts spouting the pearls. It's right then I need some air. But when I go to kick off against the bottom, I can't. I can't get my feet under me, my, my ass is stuck. <laughs> Emergency paramedics. <laughs> They'll tell you that every year about 150 people get stuck this way, sucked by a circulation pump. You get your long hair caught or your ass and you're gonna drown. Every year tons of people do, most of them in Florida. <laughs> people just do not talk about it. Not even French people talk about everything. <laughs> Getting one knee up, I get one foot tucked under me. I get to half standing when I feel the tug against my butt. Getting my other foot under me, I kick off against the bottom. I'm kicking free, not touching the concrete, but, but not getting to the air either. Still kicking water, thrashing with both arms. I may be halfway to the surface, but, but not going any higher. The heartbeat inside my head is getting loud and fast. The bright sparks of light are crossing and crisscrossing my eyes. I turn and look back, but, but it doesn't make any sense. This thick rope, some kind of snake, blue white and braided with veins has come out of the pool brain drain and it's holding onto my butt. Some of the veins are leaking blood, red blood that looks black underwater and drifts away from little rips in the pale skin of the snake. The blood trails away, disappearing in the water, and inside the snake's thin blue-white skin, you can see lumps of some half-digested meal. That is the only way this makes sense. Some horrible sea monster. <laughs> A sea serpent. Something that's never seen the light of day. It's been hiding in the dark bottom of the pool drain just waiting to eat me. <laughs> so, so I kick at it. I kick at the slippery, rubbery, knotted skin and veins of it, and more of it seems to pull out of the pool drain. It's maybe as long as my leg now, but still holding tight around my butthole. With another kick, I'm an inch closer to getting another breath, still feeling the snake tug at my ass. I'm an inch closer to my escape. Knotted, inside the snake, you can see corn and peanuts. <laughs> you can see a long, bright orange ball. It's that kind of horse pill vitamin my dad makes me take to help put on weight, to get a football scholarship with extra iron and omega-3 fatty acids. <laughs> it's seeing that vitamin pill that saves my life. It's not a snake. <laughs> it's my large intestine. My colon pulled out of me. What doctors would call prolapsed. It's my gut sucked into the drain. Paramedics will tell you that a swimming pool pump pulls 80 gallons of water every minute. That's about 400 pounds of pressure. The big problem is we're all connected, connected together inside. Your ass is just the far end of your mouth. If I let go, the pump keeps working, keeps unraveling my insides until it's got my tongue. Imagine taking a 400 pound shit and you can see how this might turn you inside out. What I can tell you is your guts don't feel much pain, not the way your skin feels pain. The stuff you're, you're, the stuff you're digesting, doctors call it fecal matter. Higher up is chyme, pockets of thin, runny mess studded with corn and, and peanuts and round green peas. That, that's all this, this soup of blood and corn, shit and sperm and peanuts floating around me. 
Even with my guts unraveling out my ass, me holding on to what's left, even then my first want is to somehow get my swimsuit back on. <laughs> God forbid my folks see my dick. My one hand holding a fist around my ass, my other hand snags my yellow striped swim trunks and pulls them from around my neck. Still getting back into them is impossible. You want to see your intestines? Go buy a pack of those lambskin condoms, take one out and unroll it, pack it with peanut butter, smear it with petroleum jelly and hold it under water. Then try to tear it. Try to pull it in half. It is just too tough and rubbery. It's so slimy, you cannot hold on. A lambskin condom, that's just plain old intestine. Now you can see what I'm up against. You let go for a second, and you're gutted. You swim for the surface for a breath, and you're gutted. You don't swim, and you drown. This is a choice between being dead right now and a minute from right now. What my folks will find after work is a big naked fetus curled in on itself, floating in the cloudy water of their backyard pool, tethered to the bottom by a thick rope of veins and twisted guts, the opposite of a kid hanging himself to death while he jacks off. <laughs> This is the baby they brought home from the hospital 13 years ago. Here is the kid they hoped would snag a football scholarship and get an MBA. The kid who would care for them in their old age. Here are all their hopes and dreams floating here naked and dead. All around him, big milky pearls of wasted sperm. It's either that or my folks will find me wrapped in a bloody towel, collapsed halfway between the pool, and the pool and the kitchen telephone, the ragged torn scrap of my guts still hanging out one leg of my yellow striped swim trunks. What even the French won't talk about. <laughs> that big brother in the Navy, he taught us one other good phrase, a Russian phrase. The way that we say, I need that like I need a hole in my head. Russian people, they say, I need that like I need teeth in my asshole. Nie eto nado kach zubi va nyatsa. Those stories you hear, about how animals caught in a trap will chew off one leg? Well, any coyote will tell you that a couple bites beats the hell out of being dead. Even if you're Russian, someday you just might want to have those teeth. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, what you have to do is you have to twist around, you hook one elbow behind your knee and you pull that leg up into your face. You bite and snap at your own ass. You run out of air and you will chew through anything to get that next breath. It's not something you want to tell a girl on the first date. <laughs> not if you expect a kiss goodnight. <laughs> if I told you how it tasted, you would never ever again eat calamari. It's really, it's really, really hard to say what my folks were more disgusted by, how I got into trouble or how I saved myself. <laughs> After the hospital, my mom, she said, you didn't know what you were doing, honey. You were in shock. And she learned how to cook poached eggs. All those people out there, all grossed out or, or just feeling sorry for me, I need that like I need teeth in my asshole. <laughs> nowadays, nowadays people always tell me I look too skinny. 
People at dinner parties, they get all quiet and pissed off when I, when I don't eat the pot roast they cooked. Pot roast kills me, baked ham. Anything that hangs around inside my guts for longer than a couple hours, it comes out still food. Home-cooked lima beans or chunk-light tuna fish all stand up and find it still sitting there in the toilet. <laughs> After you've had a radical bowel resectioning, you don't digest meat so great. Most people, you have five feet of large intestine. I'm lucky to have my six inches. So I never got a football scholarship. I never got that MBA. Both my friends, the wax kid and the carrot kid, they grew up, they got big. But I've never weighed a pound more than I did that day when I was 13. Another big problem was my folks, they paid a lot of good money for that swimming pool. In the end, my dad just told the pool guy it was a dog. The family dog fell in and drowned. The dead body got pulled into the pump. Even when the pool guy cracked open the filter casing and fished out a, a rubbery tube, a watery hank of intestine with a big orange vitamin pill still inside. <laughs> Even then, my dad says, that dog was fucking nuts. <laughs> Even from my upstairs bedroom window, you could hear my old man say, we couldn't trust that dog alone for a second. <laughs> then my sister missed her period. Even after they changed the pool water, after they sold the house and we moved to another state, after my sister's abortion, even then my folks never mentioned this again, ever. That is our invisible carrot. Now, you can take a good deep breath. I still have not. That is guts. You know, I always know when a story is working, when I get really shaky when I'm doing it. And there's always a point where, when I'm writing, I know I'm writing what I should be writing, when secretly in my mind I'm thinking, there's no way I can even read this in workshop, much less, <laughs> much less read this in front of strangers. So that is why Tom Spanbauer calls what he teaches dangerous writing because there is that enormous sense of, of risk and, in a way, danger, not just in, in writing it, but in reading it. And, uh, and it was such a joy to read this on tour last year. It leaves me shaking like a leaf. It totally does. And if there isn't a podium, I am really fucked. <laughs> <laughs> but last year on tour, Oh, I, just out of curiosity, did anybody conk out tonight? Do we have any, we had a one conk out? Just the one? Two? Okay, so did we have even one conk out? Okay, I'll take that as a 53. Last year in San Francisco, 
after, even after the Santas disrupted the event and sprayed me with whipped cream and made a huge mess, in the middle of that story, people still passed out. And afterwards, the enormously long signing line, part of the way through the line was this very elderly Asian woman, beautifully dressed with a, a very young teenage boy. And she gets up to the head of the line and very loudly in front of all these people left, this is gonna sound awful, but this is how it said, sounded. She goes, ah, oh, ah, oh, I tell my grandson, I tell him, don't you never stick nothing up your penis. <laughs> And this, this poor kid. <laughs> and at another reading, a woman, well, actually, she came up and she waited through the entire event to tell me afterwards. She said, uh, she said, I've never told anybody this. But when I was like eight or nine years old, and I was a little like a brownie, which is like a precursor to a Girl Scout, and she was my age, so that would have been in the 60s, she said I had a stomach ache, so my mother put a heating pad on my stomach. And it was a heating pad that had a, like a vibrating function. And she found that if the heating pad slid down and got sort of bunched between her legs, something happened. So she's like eight, nine years old really getting off on this heating pad. <laughs> she has no idea. So she goes and she invites her entire brownie troop back. <laughs> so we got like 20 little brownies all in the little brown uniform with a little cap, <laughs> all having multiple orgasms with mom's heating pad. <laughs> and this girl is the most popular girl in her class. <laughs> She is almost selling tickets. <laughs> and then one day mom comes home from work early and catches them and sends the little girls home and beats the crap out of this woman <laughs> and says, you fucking slut. <laughs> and this woman says, I have never told anybody that story, but compared to God's, I can tell that story now. 